help people benefit from virtual human interaction if we get through that part. Um, as you saw in my previous talk, this is where I work. Uh, this is uh, our lab, an interdisciplinary group. Variety of topic areas. This time you'll hear the sound. Uh, that's our PTSD. One of the scenarios within that, you'll see more of that. Um, this is a variation of that that we applied where we took, we took the exposure therapy application and translated into tests of cognitive function, uh, immersive tests of attention, memory, and executive function uh, that could be done in a military relevant context to assess the impact of brain injury uh, after somebody's been, you know, uh, had a had a brain injury in a combat environment um, and uh, where the cognitive performance is essential for making a return to duty decision and where cognition, as we know, is affected by uh, affective issues. So, uh, well, why not do the assessment within that relevant environment? I'm not going to prattle on too much about these. This is, we don't just do civilian work. Uh, this is one from 1996, actually. Uh, a 3D projection system that we worked with back in the Stone Age of VR for assessing and training mental rotation and other visual spatial abilities. This is a virtual classroom. If we have time, we'll touch on this uh, for testing children with attention deficit hyperactivity disorder or anybody with a cognitive uh, attention process impairment. Child has to pay attention to what's on the blackboard and try to ignore these distractions like the kid that in, in the back just threw a paper airplane or the teacher answering the door or a school bus going by the window, et cetera. Uh, we've done quite a bit of work with motor rehabilitation, post-stroke, TBI, orthopedic injury, in this case with a Microsoft Connect, uh, capturing user movement for a range of motion activity, hopefully to make very boring and repetitive and frustrating activities of physical rehab more fun and engaging. In this case, we took the same technology with the Cerebral Palsy Foundation and the, the task was very simple, help children who have never been able to play a video game because of their uh, motor impairments, help them to be able to play with whatever motor capabilities they have. And so that movement in the screen of her right arm picking up, that's the only movement she had real volitional control over. So the Connect captured that movement and helped to actuate, turned her body into the interface for driving the shark in this little game. Um, finally, uh, some virtual human work in case we don't get to the end uh, and touch on these things. Um, this is a an example of a virtual patient application. This is a, a project we did for the School of Social Work where we helped social workers in training practice clinical skills with virtual patients that represented military populations. And I'll let these, I'll let this one play. Good afternoon, Sergeant Castilla. What brings you in today? Well, my wife told me she thought I should talk to someone. She's been pretty concerned about me since a soldier suicided on base last week. Did you happen to know the soldier? Yes. He wasn't a friend, but I met the Marine once or twice. He seemed normal at the time. I guess I'm afraid I might end up like him. Do you have any plans to hurt yourself? No. It certainly caught my mind, especially lately. I just need it all to stop. Sometimes I can't handle it. Okay, so I like to say when it comes to the application and it gives novice clinicians a chance to screw up a bunch with a virtual patient before they get their hands on a live one, which might be a useful direction to pursue in clinical training. Um, minimize risk due to uh, clinicians that are still kind of learning the ropes. Uh, next is SimCoach, and this is an example of an online intelligent virtual agent that we developed for, for the military, for veterans actually, uh, where basically it was designed to be a healthcare support agent where veterans, service members, or family who didn't want to talk to a real person about the troubles they were having when they returned uh, from war. Um, or their loved one returned from war, they could go and talk to this guy and find out about PTSD and so on and uh, get answers. Meanwhile, the character could ask the user questions and 
actually develop a model of the user in the sense of these questions being diagnostic screening questions. And at some point, if the user gave responses that added up to a certain threshold on a PTSD scale, the character might say, you know, it looks like you're going through some real challenges. Now, if you want to punch in your postal code over here and I'll pop up a list of providers in your area. And if you want, um, I can talk to you about what therapy involves and answer your question. So never, not about building a virtual AI agent to replace clinicians, but rather uh, to help pe to break down barriers to care, to put a toe in the water, uh, where people that wouldn't seek help with a live provider might not actually go through with it, but may do so after interacting well, with I'm this guy. Well, I'm not a real person, if that's what you're asking, but I'm based on the personality and experiences of real soldiers and Marines. I'm still just a piece of software, but I'm getting better all the time, so hopefully I can be a helpful piece of software to talk to. Anyway, that's his introduction. Hopefully we'll have a little time later to see a little bit more of them. So what is VR? I'm sure we all know, so I'm not gonna beat the, the definition to the ground, but a collection of enabling technologies, uh, computers, interfaces, body tracking, sensory displays, all with the point of building simulations that people can interact within or with. Uh, the more human-centric definition is just a more natural human computer interaction format where we can leverage human natural action to interact with c computers or content, something that makes a lot of sense to me when you look at the history of computing. Let's get beyond the mouse and keyboard so we're not just limited to hunting and packing. Um, when we talk about VR, I think of the three eyes, immersion, interactivity, <clears throat> and imagination. Um, you don't always have to have all three, but you should have at least two. So, for example, this is seen from a user interacting in the Brave My PTS uh, application. He's wearing a headset. He's immersed within a simulated environment that responds in a semi-natural way with his actions. We can do that as well with upper extremity physical therapy, as you see here. This user is wearing a sensor within on the front of the VR headset and it's capturing his hand movements as he's interacting with 3D content. And uh, here's an example of one of the games that we've developed for physical therapy. Um, in this case, closing, moving the hand by manual coordination and so forth. And again, the goal here is to, to be able to build things that um, not only quantify user actions to measure performance like this application does, but uh, make it fun and engaging so people do more of it. Um, let's jump ahead here. Interactivity, it doesn't always need to be uh, highly immersive. In this case, obviously, the user is in a lab and the Connect camera, older version, is capturing the users shifting their weight side to side in a balance training activity. So imagine an elderly person wearing a safety harness, shifting their weight side to side. Uh, to drive that little penguin down the slope. You lean forward, it goes faster. You lean back, it slows down. Um, and it doesn't always have to be on a large screen. Uh, you know, users, if you build compelling and fun content, will interact even on a small screen like this. Um, and it doesn't always have to be um, immersive for interactivity with intelligent agents. A lot of our virtual human work doesn't require a headset. You can do it on a laptop or a big screen TV, makes it a little bit more realistic. Uh, but in this case, this is a job interview training application that we developed for helping um, adolescents and young adults on the high end of the autism spectrum practice their job interviewing skills. So a uh, variety of characters, different settings that they can be in, and different personality types to make the interviews more or less challenging. So in this case, this character will be set in the hostile mode. I'm glad you're here. Oh, in sorry. a minute, we'll get so, into some questions about the job. But before we do, why don't you just tell me about yourself? We can make her hostile as well, but let's jump to another character and put her in a different backdrop and make her hostile. This is an entry-level position. I guarantee there will be things you won't like about this job. That said, 
what's the most important thing you think you're looking for in a job? Okay. So, um, as you saw in my previous talk, wide variety of areas where VR has been applied usefully. Um, a lot of reasons why that is the case. I'm not going to beat that into the ground. If you're interested, send me an email. I'll send you this paper where all that stuff is laid out. Um, but, you know, again, the key elements here are expose, distract, motivate, measure, and engage. Very simple ways to think about the power of VR as we move into some of these areas. Now, I'm going to fly through these first two areas because you've seen them already um, in my earlier talk, and I don't I want to get on to the other areas. But overcoming fear, you know, if you're claustrophobic, you can put people in controlled stimulus environments, ultimate Skinner box in 1997, even though the graphics relatively sucked. You put people with claustrophobia in a room in Christine Batella's lab in Spain and close the door on them and then gradually move the wall in on them. Uh, as you saw earlier, the walking uh, over a rope bridge uh, for fear of um, heights. The interesting thing back then was even though the uh, graphics were really poor, people with phobias were primed to react to it like the real thing. And that's the beauty of this kind of technology and exposure therapy. It doesn't have to be an exact replica of reality for it to have a, an emotionally evocative impact that can support the therapeutic effect of that we try to induce with exposure therapy. And, you know, that's a key element here that um, the brain, you know, your frontal lobes may tell you that you're just in a simulation, uh, but your limbic system or your amygdala may react as if it's the real thing because it's reacting to the perceptual array of the stimuli and therefore the clinical application. Oh, what's going on there? Um, is effective as. I showed in that one of the early uh, videos in the previous talk, things like fear of heights. These applications have gotten much better. And of course, the one where you have to rescue the kitty cat that pits your fear of heights against your love of cats and a whole variety of these applications, as you saw in my last talk, have been evolved for these different types of phobias. Um, the evidence, as I mentioned earlier, uh, a number of meta-analyses, our group, another group in 2008, documenting the value of VR and exposure. 2012, a group out of Romania and Spain partnered in that one. 2015, a group out of the Netherlands evolved it. And finally, the more recent one and series of papers in the Journal of Anxiety Disorders documenting the value of VR for exposure. So then we go on to traumatic experiences. Can we use exposure therapy for that? And our work, of course, of course, was certainly driven by um, problems with veterans with combat related. But other, we're not the first people to do it. These are earlier applications for virtual Vietnam, believe it or not, back in 1997. Anyway, um, a lot of these uh, with small samples showed value. Uh, just as a quick refresher, this is what our brave mind application looks like. A series of world finishing and control and pace the exposure that a pace the patient can handle. By going through it there, it's not going through my head at night when I'm trying to sleep or when I'm with my wife, when times when I don't want it to, to come up and me start thinking about it. Traumatic things are not normal. You cannot handle the, the things that you've seen and done. And this is a tool that has helped me out tremendously. Reliving the worst moments of his life has helped him to move on with his life. I'm probably about 80% of who I was before I left, but I think that's pretty good after seeing and doing the things that you've done. For Nightline, this is Dan Harris in Atlanta. Okay, so one of the key things to think about here is that this technology is all cool and everything, but um, you know it's not a replacement for a good clinician. Technology doesn't fix anyone. It's a tool to help extend the skills of a well-trained clinician. And in our application for, with PTSD, this is what a standard control panel looks like. And this allows the clinician over here to 
um, pace the exposure based around the patient's trauma narrative. The patient is impassive, they're narrating their experience as they would with traditional prolonged exposure using um, imagination only. VR is simply added in as a tool to enhance that effect. Um, as you saw earlier, I talked about some of the data. Here's a, another study. I'm not going to go through the ones I already presented, but this is one conducted by Barbara Rothbaum uh, showing change over time, followed up to a year. And the reason I'm showing this one in contrast is that uh, they also collected data on startle response, physiological markers over period up to six months, showing progressive declines in the hyper, hyper arousal component. Um, of PTSD, as well with uh, saliva cortisol showing reductions when presented in simulations with provocative content, showing less activation. And another group, uh, Mike Roy's group, did a pre-post fMRI study pretty early on, two studies in 2010, 2014, you know, showing changes in brain activation pre and post treatment in the direction that you would theoretically expect in these key brain areas for responsiveness to trauma. And again, it's not just about the efficacy, but about breaking down barriers to care. As I cited earlier, when given a choice in this last clinical randomized controlled trial, 77%, if they had a choice, would have picked VR over the traditional imagination only. Uh, I want to thank uh, for this, uh, for support in this work, a number of companies that have stepped in and helped out, and also um, a group that has uh, a veteran support group, a foundation called Soldier Strong. It's now actually giving away free equipment to any VA that wants to use our latest version. The original version went out to about 100 sites, and these are the 14 sites that um, of two months before COVID kicked in, we started distributing to uh, with the support of Soldier Strong. Um, and then COVID kind of shut things down a bit, but we're getting ready to ramp up as things hopefully get better in that area. Next area I want to talk about, I'm only on number three, hopefully I'll get through the rest, uh, is using VR to reduce pain perception or the distract element as opposed to expose. And with acute pain, VR has shown value and it's theoretically informed just as the application of VR for exposure therapy is. So we know that distraction for acute pain has value. Distracting attention away from the noxious stimuli reduces the perception of pain. Um, and that VR games can draw heavily on those attentional resources. The head mount display removes the user from the pain delivering environment. Variety of reasons why from a theoretical perspective it makes a difference. And Hunter Hoffman did the seminal work in this area back in the late 90s, published in 2000, where he compared somebody getting intensive burn wound care, very painful, hard to medically manage with opiates or other pain reducing medications. Um, uh, and he compared playing a, a video game already distracting with a primitive Stone Age VR headset and found the blue is the VR pain perception metrics, the red is the already distracting Nintendo. You see significant differences and in this study on the right, this is with skin with uh, physical therapy after getting a skin graft, another extremely painful procedure, but necessary. Um, you see the effect lasting over multiple sessions. So it wasn't simply um, the novelty of VR, it endured over time. And these findings have been replicated over the last 20 years. Another study, I think this one's 2011. Um, other studies, Hoffman and as well, looked at brain activation with experimentally induced pain on the feet with a hot uh, thermistor applied to the feet. How long can you take that pain? Even though it was non-damaging, it was still painful. And this is your brain on VR and your brain not on VR showing changes in activation in five core areas for pain perception. And the good news is <clears throat> there is a ton of content out there. Um, you can download sometimes very cool free applications that can run in a standalone headset. You don't need an exotic computer to do this. And this is an important area for breaking down barriers to care. No longer do people have to push around a cart with a PC and a tethered headset. You can pull out of your back pocket an Oculus Quest or even a Samsung Gear VR and give it to a patient to help them uh, to experience some of these worlds as well as pain 
uh, distracting worlds that are specifically developed. This is a variation on the burn wound content. Uh, it's like a snow world was the original application that was used in that research, but now more modern and more fluid version and a relaxation scenario and an exotic Salvatore Dali like home. And there's a bunch of cool stuff that has been really found to be useful. And again, looking at the literature, 2017 meta-analyses, you know, show that uh, there's real value in this. The research is documenting. The research is caught up with the vision here, um, as it has, of course, in exposure therapy and in other areas. Uh, if you, aside from acute pain, what about discomfort management? So people going through chemotherapy. This is virtual reality. Today, 27-year-old breast cancer patient Cindy Worthing will solve a mystery on the Titanic during her treatment. <clears throat> no passengers. That means you. So, George. very basic and primitive content. This is back in 2004, 2002 to 2004, I believe, or 2000, actually. Um, and that early work showed a lot of value in terms of patient appeal and preference and desire to continue using VR. And another cool effect they found was perception of time was compressed. So patients were asked how long they spent. And as you'll see here, their estimations were the time passed quickly. They asked me at the end of taking the, after the treatment, how long I had, they thought I was on doing the virtual reality. And I said, oh, about 20 minutes and really it had been an hour. But this high Couldn't believe it when it was finished because I didn't get to complete the game even. So, uh, when do you want to stay in chemo because you want to finish it? Um, anyway, uh, up to the current date, a new study came coming out at the beginning of the year um, showing VR actually outperforming not only the standard of care, which is really nothing and uh, not that fun and engaging, certainly, uh, being in a infusion room with a lot of sick people. If you've ever been through chemo, you'll know what I'm talking about. It's not all that enticing to want to be there. Um, but VR outperformed that easily and outperformed music therapy, uh, which was another approach that was commonly used. But music therapy um, did it better than the standard of care as well. So that's a promising area. So what are these patients doing in the virtual world? For Pierre, he's actually moving his pain-free arm. But when he looks through the goggles, he sees the injured arm doing the work. In this case, trying to pop balloons that are floating all around him. After just five sessions, he says his pain disappeared. The cost to me was really minimum, you know, just a little bit of time and no side effects. Dr. Sean Mackey, one of the nation's top pain experts, says the treatment works by tricking the brain. And that's where the excitement for VR comes in, is the opportunity to rewire our brains into a more normal state so that we're not experiencing as much pain. Is this the future of pain management? I think it's one of the critical futures of pain management. Oh, yeah. So that's, when we're talking about chronic pain, much different animal than acute pain. Can't wear a VR headset 24 seven. So we've got to do other things. Um, how far can we go in this area? People are coming up with everything from, you know, of course, phantom limb pain to pain of childbirth. I'm sure this guy in Mexico in 2008 was getting some analgesic medication, but the VR simulation was just helping him to kind of take his mind off of it uh, if he wasn't completely um, anesthetized. Okay, next area, physical rehab. Um, traditional PT, uh, physical therapy and occupational therapy, sometimes not that much fun, maybe a little demeaning playing with Fisher Price toys, but you know, the people were doing what they could to make uh, this work engaging to get people to do more of it. I'm not sure a lot of these folks, when they went home and they weren't around their clinician, if they actually followed through and did this kind of stuff at home. So, this is where VR comes into the mix. You know, try to make it fun and engaging. Even though you don't have the haptic element, we can add that in now uh, with various mixed reality activities where you're actually interacting with physical objects as the interface a project we're working on now to make these a little bit more relevant in terms of uh, physical activity uh, or physical weight and touch in the mix but you can start to see some of the different application and here's one of our early stroke patients i think this was back in 2004 or 5 
feel like um, I'm uh, in on the cutting edge. <laughs> and that is very exciting. That's what we want. OK, um, <clears throat> so again, you always start with theory. Why VR? Well, uh, we know the criteria for good rehab tasks. It's data driven. You know, you're doing proper assessment. You know what you need to work. You're not just providing global stimulation and flailing training. You're actually trying to be focused. You can adjust the difficulty level, deliver it repetitively and hierarchically. You can quantify the task to assess prog progress, give feedback strategically, make it relevant to real world function and motivate participation, which is important when you look at all the different factors. There are many factors that drive good rehab. Um, exercise and repetition and adherence the more you do, the better you're going to have results, and it's hard to motivate people uh, when they're on their own. We also know attention, novelty, and reward, according to Mike Merznick's model for neuroplasticity, drive different neurotransmitter systems that underlie neuroplasticity brain change, while attention, novelty, and reward are also elements of well-designed games. So. We know that we can enhance motivation by giving people a way, even when they're doing basic exercise, to take their mind off of it and to have a goal state. Uh, and so people have been doing this with advanced robotic devices like this, very expensive. Um, and the results here, after 20 hours of practice, show real significant changes in a variety of standard measures in occupational and physical therapy and clinical trials have documented the value of this approach um, using you know a variety of apps like our connect app from the old days and some of our newer stuff um, we've built out worlds like exercise courses where you navigate through the world and do different exercises in different places trying to make it fun and engaging and if you look at the literature again by reviewing the meta-analyses out there in 2011, potentially useful in 2016, equivalent to traditional therapies, um, 2017, this group said it was more effective than traditional rehab. I'm not sure if you can beat reality, but maybe in some cases with some folks, if you can motivate them to do more therapy. Uh, then it may have the potential to be more effective than traditional rehab. And this more recent 2020 app, again, shows the value of it, whether it's as a standalone. I tend to think, you know, you got to have a mix. You want your clinician in there doing real physical activity um, to promote this area, as well as the VR. And if you can send the VR stuff home with low-cost systems, uh, like a variety of companies are doing. A lot of these companies are building out applications for in-clinic uh, work. There's a number of companies in this area now. Uh, this one has a send home device that is very well built. Uh, the Penumbra real system um, that really creates with a standalone headset um, over and sensors that you can wear on different parts of the body uh, really good compelling experiences okay real quick we're going to just spend one slide on this area so we can get to the other areas um, virtual reality for exercise and relaxation well on one end you've got off the shelf games that you can play like beat saber i don't know if anybody's ever played this but i'm i'm an addict this is actually a very fun game uh, and you get a little bit of a workout, especially as you get up to the higher levels here. Um, get a little music going with it. Um, Welcome on the to other Magic end. Horizons. Relax. Breathe and, oh, and relax. Oh, you are here do you think might not have in a safe location, enjoying a wonderful relaxation experience. Now, you get the idea with that. We're going to jump on to six. We're almost getting there and I've got 10 minutes left, I guess. So um, hopefully, um, anyway, hopefully my clock is correct. I think I might have it set fast. Maybe we've got a couple more minutes, but anyway, um, <clears throat> as I said earlier, test, train, teach and treat while we can teach uh, 
well, I mean, I'm, I'm sorry, expose, distract, motivate, measure, and engage. We can motivate people, as you saw with the, P, with the uh, uh, physical and occupational therapy. We also measure, we can test and train performance as in a virtual classroom. People have done a variety of work in cognitive assessment and rehab following TBI and stroke. Early work out of the UK, David Brown's group out of Nottingham, <clears throat> developed a whole series of functional environments. Um, all, it's kind of an unsung area of VR, but it really occurred back um, during a time of the beginning trials with exposure therapy. Uh, people were testing, particularly in this supermarket environment, training people with cognitive disabilities, um, how to operate in functional environments like a supermarket. And this application actually showed um, transfer of training from the VR world, as impoverished as that is, to the actual real world upon which it was um, modeled after for training navigation and finding objects or finding products in a supermarket. And these were people with IQs, if you buy that measure, uh, between 60 and 80 um, and showing real benefit and transfer training to the real world. So that kicked off a whole nother field. Of course, now advancing into the future with a kitchen environment uh, uh, that is really quite well done for training functional activities that have a cognitive basis in a real world environment. Our work with a virtual classroom, as you saw earlier, this is what the child sees in the headset that's supposed to be paying attention to the blackboard and responding to a certain sequence of letters <clears throat> while distractions play out. We actually started this work in, in 1999. Uh, very primitive. I'm embarrassed to show what that looked like. But in 2003, we got some funding and built it out a little bit. And early work with that area showing children with attention deficit versus a control group on key metrics of attention, missed targets, hitting impulsive responding commission errors uh, when there's no target, reaction time or reaction time variability showed real differences in these groups. So the beginnings of a diagnostic measure. Uh, one good thing with VR, when I talk about measurement, um, what you're seeing here, that red line is a randomly selected ADHD child, and it's a, their head turning movement in the classroom over a 10 minute test. And you can see over time, the head movement and the fidgeting um, increases. If you look real close down here, you see a green line going through there. That's a randomly selected healthy control. Hardly any movement. Well, VR helps you to visualize this data, to quantify head movement in ways that were never possible to do, even with the best computer delivered attention tasks like the TOVA and, and so forth. Um, but we can go a step beyond this. So we can actually take that head movement in those two subjects and paste it onto virtual heads and show a parent, this is your child versus a neurotypical child facing the blackboard where they're supposed to be attending at 57 seconds. ADHD child's doing pretty well. It'll look away at a distraction. Um, but now jump into five minutes ahead. I just advanced time a little bit. <clears throat> you see the child now becoming more distractible, even though They've seen some of these distractors a couple of times already. And when they get distracted, they have a hard time getting back on task. As you can see here, I'm going to jump uh, to seven minutes here into the test. Here we go. This is the actual head movement of that child. And now he's going to catch sight of the paper airplane floating around the room. Uh, there he goes. He caught it. Now he's going to follow it. Now he's going to look up at the ceiling and you can see how utterly distractible these kids are um, in this context. And it might be helpful for the awareness of the parent and the child um, to the challenges they face. And as well, we can quantify that data. We can actually measure how many times a child's looking out the window uh, when there's a target in front of them and they're missing it versus how many times are they looking at the target and not responding, which is a loss of focus versus 
perhaps a distractibility error, two different kinds of attention challenges that require different approaches. Anyway, um, that was designed to be a product in 2003. <clears throat> it was a little bit ahead of its time and never made it as a product, but became a good research tool that we shared worldwide and uh, developed a wide body of scientific literature on the application, leading to our partnership with a company that came out of China. This is a version that was tested in Taiwan, but now has a um, normative data set of about 700 kids that now we're comparing with the United States with kids with documented ADHD on and off medications uh, to evolve the data set that will be useful for clinicians to make diagnostic decisions based on performance. Okay, we're in the home stretch here. Um, we can develop applications with virtual humans. I'm only going to be able to touch on a slice of this. Um, so um, panic disorder, these characters were simple props. Uh, they didn't have really much interaction, maybe a little bit of ambient movement, but their use as an exposure uh, stimulus for panic disorder and agoraphobia showed it worked as good as the real thing. And it's hard to do the real thing in vivo exposure where you get enough people to do it in a systematic way. And more recently, in 2017, Stephen Bouchard in Canada, in a similar application for social phobia, uh, what's going on here? There we go. Um, showed that, that doing that type of exposure worked um, even better than in vivo exposure because you do more trials in VR. So even though these characters you'd never mistake for the real thing, they activate the areas of the brain that may underlie this kind of extinction learning that we're trying to promote. Um, <clears throat> the work that we did with job interviewing. These are the different characters. I've showed you two of them earlier on, but this is the whole rogues gallery of characters. Um, and here's um, here's somebody that went through the simulations. It's a good program, and it teaches you how to do an interview, and it teaches you how to be in an interview situation with another, with another person. And did you see your performance improve? Did it, you get better? I get, I get, I get better every single time I do it. I get better. So that's data from the first published study with 64 kids or teenagers, <clears throat> and you can see face-to-face -face interview ratings by vocational counselors and stepwise improvement um, with practice with the vocational interview training agent, and then actual performance improvements in a real-world interview. Um, now we've expanded this work uh, with different characters and questions for um, incarcerated juvenile delinquents, for service members and veterans, and opening up this approach for a wide range of hey, folks. Thanks for coming in. Thanks and for experimenting with augmented Hi. reality, uh, whereas you see this okay. user Thank wearing you. a Magic Leap headset, Why don't you start by telling uh, where they yourself. see through the headset into the real world, oh, and well, the virtual character um, pops up across the desk with them. So and, just looking ahead uh, to the future. I, I've been. Okay, I'm gonna jump through this. I'm not gonna show the video, but other work with social skill training with virtual humans, uh, with avatars driven by real people, um, interacting with um, um, a person with autism, showing changes in brain activation pre and post uh, training in the areas thought to ally, underlie social interaction in the brain. And a larger study was published expanding on those results from the clinical trial. I don't have time to show this video because I want to get to this next area. Virtual patients, you know, the idea of using actor patients for training MDs has been around since 1964, I think. Um, but it's hard to get patients that are well trained to emulate the activity and re represent a range of ages and ethnic backgrounds. So this opens the door for our work with virtual patients. And as you saw earlier, we've got this kind of an app here, yeah, but please. this was in 2007, our very first virtual patient. For this conference, I wanna show this because this was the target area that we addressed. These medical students 
were given an index card with a referral question. Mother referring um, daughter doesn't want to leave her room, um, doesn't want to go back to school. That's all they had. And here's a sample interview. Hello, my name is Dr. Davis. Uh, Hello. What, what brings you into the office today? Nothing bad happened that night. I'm sorry to hear that. Um, can you tell me what happened? I was in the car with Eddie and he stopped the car and wanted me to kiss him, but when I tried to stop him, he threatened me with a knife. When did this happen to you, Justina? So you can see this character is so very I thought I might die. very stereotypic gesture and movement, uh, not a wide range. It must have been very tough for you. Yeah, it's but still you see nice. this guy getting into the interview now. Do you find yourself uh, still being bothered by what happened? Whenever thoughts of the event pop into my head, I put my iPod on real loud. Uh, you mentioned thoughts pop into your head. What, what kind of thoughts pop into your head? I want to get away. When you think about it, you, you feel like you need to get away? That horrible time replays in my mind over and over. So this was our first war showing that even though the character was relatively impoverished and simple, the, the trainees actually asked all the right questions compared to what they asked of a standardized actor patient. So that was very encouraging for a small sample of, I think, 16 or 17 medical students. But that's led to the current time in 2017, we got to this level or we could have a variety of different characters and different kinds of clinical backdrops. And, you know, basically, as I mentioned, we have a library of different characters. Uh, uh, child actor patients are very hard to come by. We have a number of them and so on. Um, and really, you know, we have the capacity to control a lot of factors like what weight class the character is in. Um, and really the pitch here is to go beyond the see one do one teach one model in medicine and in cl other clinical arts like social work and psychology to improve performance one last one and this is one we done for training clinicians hey, how's it going in motivational interviewing and a scaffolded learning you give users uh, a choice I'm of good. Look, types of responses this is they my wife's idea report them back anyway this study was recently published in the Journal of American Medical Association in a randomized control trial showing actual improvement from this training versus a control group um, that did a, an online training application exclusively and showed that it tra the training actually transferred to a live actor patient and ratings of their performance. So this was very encouraging. Anyway, um, I'm getting to the end here, so I just want to close real quick with just a summary of the areas uh, where I think, uh, and this is a limited summary. These are just some of the areas where VR has been of value. There's probably at least six or seven other really cool areas I haven't had time to cover, but these are the big ones, I think, anyway. Um, and there's a big market out there, uh, Goldman Sachs, you know, obviously predicts video games and entertainment as the big market for VR, but healthcare comes in second. Um, and that up, has been updated recently, um, showing, you know, a lot of value there. Companies are emerging everywhere virtually better. That first one has been around since the 90s. But since then, in fact, in the last three, four years, more companies have emerged in this space uh, than in the previous 20 years. So vibrant community, also vibrant scientific community, a recent conference that just took place uh, in Amsterdam, VR days, but conferences popping up all over the place where people of like mind can share their findings and their 
uh, creative achievements. Um, just a quick shameless promotion for an edited book. If you can't afford to buy the book, just send me an email and I'm sure I'll sneak you a PDF of uh, this book is loaded with chapters by a lot of the early pioneers in the field. And to conclude, we know VR may appeal to the young at heart. When I got my first uh, uh, Samsung Gear headset it was Christmas, I think around 2016. I flew home to Connecticut where my family was from. And uh, Christmas Day, my niece and nephew were fighting all day when we got to play in New York. But what you don't realize is it's not just for young people. Uh, the night before, I arrived around 3 in the morning, and um, my mom was waiting up for me. And um, as soon as I got in the door, first thing I said was, I need a beer. The flight was delayed. I'm anxious, but mom, let me show you this new thing. VR headset that I got. It's so real. My God, it looks like my backyard, my yard with the snow. Oh, Lord in heaven. How they ever can create this. You know what? I'm hanging on to the sink because I'm afraid I'm going to fall down, down the cliff. <laughs> hey, honest to God. You feel like, oh, you, you, if you step off, you're going to fall right in there. Holy mackerel. And one last one for my mom. If you're watching this, please fund my son's research so that he can take care of me in my old age. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, thanks, Mom. Anybody's interested, I make my talks uh, freely available for download. Uh, send me an email and I'll, I'll have it posted somewhere. And with that, I'm sorry I went over a couple minutes, but thank you very much. And um, I'll um, I'll conclude uh, my talk now. So thank you me... so much for that. I think that was extremely fascinating. I know normally you prefer to have several hours because there's so much <laughs> to, to, to pack into this. Um, uh, we have. 40 minutes left. Um, before I just quickly hand over to Tom and introduce Tom, um, Paul, are there any immediate questions or if you're happy, what I would do is um, see if we can um, maybe leave five to 10 minutes at the end. But if there are any immediate questions that people want to ask, um, please go for it now. No, then I will quickly introduce Tom and Paul. Uh, don't worry, I have I have a dozen questions. I'll just have to hold back. Um, so we're going to have two presentations by Paul, Dr. Paul Best and Dr. Tom van der van um, Paul is, is the founder of Immersive Technologies and Digital Mental Health Network uh, within the School of Social Sciences, Education and Social Work at Queen's University Belfast. So he'll be talking uh, in combination with, with Tom about the work that they've been doing. And, and Tom van der He's a clinical psychologist and the head of the expertise unit Psychology, Technology and Society at Thomas More University of Applied Service, uh, Sciences, which is in Antwerp, Belgium, just down the road from me. So thank you to both of you. I'm going to hand over now so that I give two of you to, to present your pieces. And they're focusing really on uh, making this tech as widely available as possible. Right. Thank you very much. Uh, perhaps a quick question, Skip, on my end, a very technical one. Could you please unshare your screen? Um, yeah. As uh, that will allow me to share mine in turn. I'm, I'm sorry, where do I? Um, it's just uh, on the top right, across. I think. Uh, yeah, normally it would be on the top. Uh, ah, there, there we, we go, go, right? Thank yes, you. Thanks. Perfect. I assume, I assume this should work now. Yeah, let me quickly retry. Here we go. Uh, or not. Uh, Okay, there we go. Um, so, so thank you very much um, for the introduction. Also, thank you, Skip, for a very uh, rapid but thorough overview, I guess. So Paul and I actually uh, went ahead and included some nicer pictures of ourselves, as we know that these type of meetings do not tend to show you at your prime. So uh, me to the left, Paul to the right, um, and somewhere <laughs> down below on your screen as well, I guess. Uh, um, I'm going to jump right in as I think that uh, we have some interesting stuff to share with you, uh, some interesting insights, um, primarily focusing to uh, or on virtual reality and immediate relevance and link to clinical practice. And 
whether you can go low cost and still get high return. Um, and I don't need to make a case anymore for VR, I guess. And uh, if, if I still need to, then you've probably missed out on the past 45 minutes. Uh, so there's a long history in research. It's very well established. And um, ever since, let's say, 2012, but even more in recent years, the, the rapid commercialization of devices um, is, is opening up a wide range of possibilities beyond the, the highly specialized uh, settings where VR was limited to previously. Um, and, and we've seen a couple of them indeed uh, already in, in skip stock. And, and just, I mean, it's not like I have a stock in any of these, it's just to highlight a few. But what we now see is that complementary to these very um, low level accessible devices that cost around like 300, 350 euros, you also now have VR platforms that offer a wide range of content that's readily available and that clinicians can or should be able to use fairly easily to, to really introduce VR as a, I wouldn't say standard, but increasingly common part of treatment. Um, and that, that's good news, uh, but you can even take it uh, slightly more accessible by looking at the potential of non-mental health applications that still might be relevant. Like I don't have a kitty on the plank, but it's still, it's basically the same plank. It's called Richie's plank. Um, it's perhaps not the very first step in the treatment of fear of heights. Uh, it could be one of the last, though. Um, some applications that are slightly more entertaining, like liminal, um, also have a more relaxation component that might be relevant um, to, to use and are just freely accessible. And meeting in VR for a wide, well, these days even more than, than I think uh, previously, um, being able to recreate your own virtual environments, catch up with people and have meaningful exchanges there also might have clinical potential. However, and, and, and there is a however, um, therapists are not necessarily tech savvy. If, if, you're, if you're not one yourself here today, um, you might know some in your uh, environment and, and I can assure you, um, it tends to be quite challenging often for them to start using virtual reality um, and also to make them sufficiently familiar with a wide range of possibilities and features and really grasping and knowing what you can do to, to optimize and to master VR environments, um, to tailor them to the treatments and your patients um, is quite important as it, it can help to, to really make the most of its therapeutic potential. And the thing is that often the, the, the VR environments and the VR software that is currently readily available, even the paid versions, um, still require transfer um, to really yeah, line up with the conventional skills and expertise um, of your average clinician. And so the question that then arises is, can you make it even more well, low level, low, uh, low, uh, less difficult, I guess, also to, to do so and to make a more meaningful um, VR or, or, or similar environment to incorporate in everyday clinical practice. And that's basically the question that we, well, that we won't answer today, I guess, but that we'll briefly focus on and that Paul will do most of the talking on um, as 360 video as a tool is um, it's not often considered conventional VR. It's sometimes even frowned upon to some extent at 360 video, immersive video um, has its limitations, which Paul will focus on as well. Um, but what we would like to show you is some, some food for thought and which, which emerges from uh, not Brussels, not from uh, where Victim Support Europe is located, but from Belfast, where there's currently a digital mental health network being set up, um, which brings together uh, not only academics, uh, but also technological companies, uh, VR developers, to be more specific to some extent, uh, other industry partners, um, clinicians, uh, and all of that uh, in, 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 well, with support from Queen's University uh, in Belfast. And coincidentally, this is also uh, a project that uh, Paul and I have been exploring together for some time now. 
Um, and hopefully Skip will also be joining in on uh, at the beginning of, of, of next year. Uh, and we're not at the point just yet where, where we can make, make concrete promises, uh, but we want to really show you the tip of the iceberg and the possibilities that might lay ahead uh, using 360 video and related technology. And Paul, I think you have a lot to say, so I'll, I'll gladly give the word or the floor to, uh, to you now. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Tom. Okay, can everyone see my screen okay? Yes. Yes, brilliant. Good stuff. So, yes, thank you. It's great to be here. Um, I think we really have to up our game now, uh, consider it skipped just at half six in the morning, uh, went through, uh, you know, a pretty impressive uh, impre presentation with a, a lot of different uh, applications for uh, for uh, virtual reality and immersive technology. So um, in terms of a bit of context to this, so yes, um, my name is Paul Best. Um, We've started and I've been linking in and talking about use of immersive technologies to support mental health practice um, for the past probably 12 to 18 months and developed a network formed around trying to bring those um, those key groups together in terms of academics, um, tech members from the tech industry, and then also uh, end users and service providers uh, to try and see if we're, there was a way of taking advantage of really the opportunities out there. But um, while my main role is within Queen's and as Programme Director for Social Work uh, and Immersive Tech Lead, uh, I also am um, a trained cognitive behavioural therapist and keep a small clinical caseload um, as well as my, the, sort of the main thrust of my academic work. But um, I mean, for me, I suppose when, I, when I've interacted with this technology, one of the things that always stands out is this stuff is, is amazing. It's impressive. There's definitely seems to be um, you know, a clear therapeutic benefit to it. But will we ever get to the point where it will be within routine um, clinical practice or routine care? Um, is the technology that accessible? And what can we really do about it uh, to make it more accessible? Um, will it go on being housed in these like specialist units or within universities where quite a, a, a small number of people um, I'll get to it and, and get to use it and get to explore its benefits. So that's kind of the context for this uh, talk. What I'm going to try and do is offer, um, you know, a clinical scenario uh, focusing on uh, PTSD or post-traumatic stress disorder and then talk about um, how we might approach it by using some of this technology, but in a very uh, cost effective manner and also thinking about how like a, a therapist uh, or a practitioner could maybe, um, you know, apply it to the step by step process. So 360 video plus this new uh, kind of amalgamation of uh, 2D, 2D images and 3D environments, which I'll which I'll try and um, demonstrate as we go on. So hopefully that makes uh, that makes sense. In terms of the context of this, so um, yes, I'm from Belfast, uh, from Northern Ireland or uh, the north of Ireland, depending on what community in particular you come from. And uh, and, and it's an important, I suppose, that to, to throw out there that so as a as a society, if you like, we, we are emerging from a period of um, you know conflict uh, where there was a lot of people exposed. Uh, to traumatic scenes, a lot of death, a lot of injury, and uh, our, our sort of, you know, recent thinking and statistics on that is that there's quite a significant uh, part of the population would meet the diagnostic criteria for post-traumatic stress disorder, okay? Even more so than that uh, is not only is this, this kind of historical sort of legacy, uh, you know, increasing the numbers of PTSD within Northern Irish society, uh, I also think about the kind of transgenerational impact of that. So what what is, was it like for the children um, of those people? Do you know, consider what we know about some of the diagnostic uh, symptoms or some some of the presented symptoms? You know, emotional numbness, um, you know, anxiety, anger, uh, those sorts of things. And in Northern Ireland, we have a, like a disproportionate um, amount of antidepressant prescribing. I was reading one report from colleagues in the other in the Ulster University, so it's the other university in Northern Ireland, and they were estimating that uh, presently there is enough um, antidepressant tablets being described by doctors that you could give everyone within the country a 20 
a seven day supply. Uh, so that just gives you a sense of how many of this type of sort of medication is being prescribed on a daily and weekly basis. Growing issues, alcohol, substance misuse, and then leading to a lower life expectancy. <laughs> Other contextual issues, this won't be unique to um, the mental health services over here, but just specialist, um, specialist treatments difficult to access, particularly um, uh, trauma focused CBT and other, um, you know, highly uh, well evidenced and highly effective therapies. There is a certain additional component, additional type of training um, that therapists need to undertake, and that's difficult to access and cost a lot of money. And there just aren't as many um, people um, trained to do it. And I, and I think thinking about Skip's talk in particular, where he was saying that virtual reality can only take you so far, and you know, it, it, it's used as a as a part of the therapist toolkit. If you like, it's not designed to replace the therapist. And then there's high dropout rates. Um, you know, high dropout rates in particular for uh, you know PTSD treatment, given the nature of uh, the condition, um, it does involve, regardless, I suppose, of the protocol you're using, there will invariably be some sort of exposure in there. It, it varies depending on that the particular approach that you're taking. Um, but by and large, you know, um, individuals. Um, aren't that keen on revisiting uh, these traumatic memories. The goal is to kind of get it out of their mind. And it can be a bit of a a bit of a shift for them to think that we're going to have to con confront and go back into this trauma memory in order to get better. And the last slide I just put in to remind myself that uh, to say that while I have spent the first couple of seconds talking about Northern Ireland, uh, this, uh, this historical issues of the trauma that I don't have the figures in front of me, but when we talk to the psychological services teams, um, a lot of the treatment for PTSD, um, you know, coming through is of a more routine nature, isn't the right word, but you know, it's road traffic accidents, it's assaults, uh, it's robberies, it's uh, difficulties during labour, traumatic births, it's injuries in manufacturing plants where people have lost digits or hands or limbs and stuff like that. So it's not that our mental health services are full of historical traumas. Uh, there's a lot of this... Um, uh, this kind of uh, single incident trauma as well. And then also just to remember that there's an idiosyncratic nature uh, to PTSD treatment um, in terms of, you know, the actual environment that someone's in that, that you know, that's, that's quite bespoke um, to, to that person. I'll, I'll return to that point in a, when, I, when, I, when I talk about something else and I explain the case, why, why that's actually important uh, in terms of the work and context of what we're trying to do. So hopefully that kind of lays out a bit about the background of the society we're in. This is a case scenario of Peter. It's kind of a amalgamation of a, some some clinical, uh, you know, cases of mine in the past. And just to kind of give us something to ground when I'm explaining this technology of how treatment might actually work. So we've got Peter, who's a 31 uh, year old male assaulted in Belfast City Centre while walking home from work. So if you can see this, uh, this picture here, um, Peter was um, chased uh, by a group of people and he ran past the wall, the sort of colourful decorated wall there and uh, tripped up and was um, was attacked then outside the dark blue building, which is a, a betting shop. So you'll kind of see that in the in the background. And he suffered a severe en a head injury and at the time thought he was going to die. OK, so as a result of this, Peter is getting daily flashbacks. Um, you know, the, the, this is triggering a lot of physical kind of reactions, somatic response to heart palpitations, sweat and anxiety. And we're seeing then, um, you know, his behaviours to manage that. Uh, he's drinking a, a, a lot more. He's very hyper vigilant, and he's now stopped going to work uh, completely. So he's, there's a lot of avoidance sort of uh, strategies and behaviours. Uh, there's very poor recall. Uh, so the memory's kind of fragmented. So, for example, uh, while you talk about certain images flashing back in his head and for his back in the space. Um, he's unsure how he ended up in the street and, and uh, some things don't are, seem out of sequence, don't quite make sense. And the last one is Peter's a, a, a big, a big fella. Uh, he's over six foot and he's got a lot of feelings of shame and guilt in terms of why he wasn't able to get away, why he didn't fight back um, uh, the way he, he believed that he should have. And that is really kind of um, sort of the powerful, powerful kind of beliefs that, he, that he's carrying around. Um, Peter's been reluctant to initially engage any form of treatment. So again, thinking about this sort of societal stigma around mental health, these feelings of shame and guilt, and then these avoidance sort of behaviours, 
that have kind of become a bit more ingrained, ingrained in the weeks and months after the, this uh, this assault occurred. But um, through a bit of persuasion uh, through family members and his doctors, he has come in for treatment. And we've been going through the uh, treatment protocol. So some psychoeducational work around um, you know, the nature of the trauma memory and how the brain processes stuff and some early work around anxiety responses and fight or flight. And we're at the stage now that uh, we want to try and introduce some imaginal exposure to try and open up this trauma memory. And uh, we're getting a bit of resistance because Peter's thinking, well, it'll make, it'll make me worse. Okay, and you tend to hear that quite a lot. You know, I came to therapy with this memory and now you're asking me to talk about it. And I don't want to talk about it because I'll, I'll make it worse. It'll give me more nightmares. Um, and I, and I, I don't want to do it. I don't want to kind of, you know, uh, put myself through that. <laughs> but after some gentle coaching and persuasion, uh, there's been some early attempts. Uh, but what we found is that Peter tends to dissociate a bit during the exposure. So by dissociate, I mean this kind of um, almost not fully in the memory. Um, so uh, sort of slightly standing apart from it, okay? Uh, no real emotional reaction as, as, as he's talking about what happened on the event. So you, you suspect that he's dissociating. Now, there'll be a lot of literature on dissociation with more sort of complex forms of PTSD. Uh, less so that I've came across, like just professionally or personally, uh, with like single incident trauma, but just for the, the sake of the case, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll, we'll leave it in there. And a site visit is also an option uh, that Peter, uh, not an option that Peter is willing to explore. So we've got this, um, we've got this case, we've got a good sense of kind of where it took place and what happened. We know the symptomatology and what's going on. And we're a bit stuck on the kind of the exposure component to it. And um, now I want to introduce this idea of how could we, an immersive environment actually help move this along uh, and support the treatment. Okay, so the great thing is about Skip and Tom's talk is that I really don't have to um, do any work here in convincing why you know it would be worth giving virtual reality technology a go or worth exploring it. So it's good evidence, uh, and Skip's part of that early group, those um, those early pioneers and leaders who have who have pushed um, this technology and kind of uh, built it from the days when it was was uh, very difficult and very specialised uh, to do and very at its early stages. And there's good evidence to show that it can be effective. There's also um, evidence to show that it's got high levels of acceptability. And I think uh, Skip put out some, some evidence and, and spoke to that in his talk. <laughs> and this idea that, you know, if we can create environments that people think are real, then they'd be quite useful um, for, you know, exposure uh, based scenarios, but also other scenarios, training, for example. OK, and then because within therapy, you know, imagery does play a key role. Um, you know, we often take cognitive therapy for say anxiety disorders and different things, but also trauma will look for sort of uh, key images uh, associated with that. So um, we feel that we're on a good kind of theoretical ground in terms of how this might enhance and open up the, 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 the sort of trauma memory and, and support uh, this work. OK, unfortunately, however, you don't have any funds because you work in a nonprofit organization or you work in the health service in Northern Ireland and unfortunately your boss doesn't have you know 20 or 30 thousand pounds to allow you to um, hire a company to recreate a simulation of, a, of an alleyway or a street uh, in Belfast in which to uh, in which to help Peter and bring him through this kind of um, this treatment uh, or sorry enhances treatment using um, full VR if you like okay so the first bit of technology that I want to um, that I want to introduce is immersive 360 video as a possible solution for this. Okay, and what is it when I say 360 video? So, for those of you, there might be people here who are very familiar with it. Others that aren't, it's essentially footage taken on a 360 camera, whereby everything uh, using multiple lenses, uh, everything is in shot. Okay, so it's not just your kind of your single um, sort of what you would see on a TV screen, a kind of panorama. Everything uh, is in shot. So what's above you, what's behind you, what's at the sides and what's below. Probably visually the easiest way to think about this. Most people have experience of Google Street through if you're ever trying to find uh, where you're going. So this idea that uh, you know you can use your your mouse and scroll around and really look in any in any direction from a fixed point. Okay. Now 
what makes it immersive? Well, if we can take this imagery and we can upload it into a virtual reality headset uh, and perhaps um, block out um, externally what's going on, maybe with headphones or whatever, uh, what we've created is an environment where someone doesn't have any external and is more likely then to focus on what's in front of them and then replacing the mouse to navigate around the screen they can turn their head okay so therefore it creates a more immersive uh, experience for, for the user what are the advantages and disadvantages then of, of using this technology i'm going to go on in a slide or two to, to show you it, um, uh, what, what it would look like um, in practice so right off the bat one of the big things that sticks out for me is the imagery is more realistic because it's not virtual, so it's it's real life imagery uh, that, that you're taking. OK. The second thing is that these 360 video environments are easy uh, are easier to create and their specialist uh, skills and knowledge is required. So the camera that I showed was a was a Samsung gear. I have, I think, the version after that and I, I bought a few of them. I bought about three or four of them last year. Uh, for a project and they're about a hundred pounds they're probably cheaper now they're very much consumer level uh, uh cameras they get a bit more difficult to use a bit more specialist when you go up the price bracket but um for this it's it's not um a lot of the consumer level cameras are pre pretty easy you know you hit the red button and uh and you can take a picture um or a video so m most people should be able to get the grips of it very quickly and because you can do it yourself, these environments are less expensive to create. You don't need to hire a photographer or a computer scientist um, to build this virtual environment for you. You can you can build it yourself. OK, an imagery can be uploaded uh, directly in the headset, what I already talked about, and the user can direct their gaze in any um, direction. Um, also, something that I wanted to, to, um, to say here that's particularly important is because it's low cost, because you can do it yourself, you can also go then to um, to a specific place where the trauma happened and create this bespoke imagery. So going back to the idea that if you had have approached your boss and he had to give you £30,000 to recreate in full VR the street where Peter got attacked, because of the bespoke nature um, of PTSD, it's hard to see how that virtual reality environment would be useful for anyone else. OK, so if there was another assault that happened in another part of Belfast or somewhere else in the north uh, or anywhere, putting the individual back in the, your yeah, sort of Peter scenario, if you like, isn't necessarily going to be uh, useful. OK, so that's just something to, to think about the advantages of where 360 video, um, some of the advantages that it offers. The disadvantages. Um, yeah, maybe, maybe one, I wouldn't focus too much on the disadvantages as you have some good stuff ahead just to keep track of time, I guess. For you. OK, <laughs> skipping right. on to the good part. OK, I'm, I'm talking too much given context. I'll, I'll get on. I'll get on with it. OK, so um, disadvantages are yes, you can't you can't move in the space. That's a big thing I want to get across. You can a fixed point and you can't in, interact with the in, uh, with the environment uh, as, as much as you can in, in full VR. So these are some kind of examples of what 360 looks like. Skip already mentioned use in training scenarios. We have tried that for 360 video as well, uh, replicating more of an observational because we can't interact, remember, with the environment where you can be in a person's home and get a good sense of what's going on and get a maybe more realistic sense of what your life as a social worker might be in the video on the left. The, the middle video is something that uh, imagery that I record. My students love me when I come in with my 360 camera uh, because this footage can be quite good for graded exposure with people with social anxiety. So that will come up quite a lot in student populations. And myself and Tom uh, have a, a doctoral student working on a project around social anxiety within ASD populations. And then the final bit on the right is the is the trauma a scenario that I'm not going to play now, but I'll show on the next um, the next slide after this. So, as a therapist, how do you get the the stage then? Um, what what is the workflow? So we've identified with Peter where the trauma took place. Okay, we then go. We get a 360 camera. This is the Insta 360 one I'm using here. Take some imagery of it. One way of doing it is, and I'm highlighting the we've. For the video I'm going to show is a slightly different uh, form of technology, but the cheapest way to do it would be upload the image onto your phone and put it onto a private YouTube channel. And then you can 
buy a, like a cardboard uh, viewer device for about five pound um and that would uh, effectively um, be a, a 360 uh, video scenario that you could use in therapy what we've used for the video that i'm going to show now is an oculus quest 2 which is about uh, 300 um i think it's the same price regardless of exchange rate 300 dollars euros uh, or pounds tom might correct me on that um but there's advantages of using that. I think if we're talking about cost effectiveness, um, you know, that's shared amongst a, you know, an entire team. It doesn't represent too much of a stretch in terms of funds, particularly the additional benefits you can get. So therapeutically, where did this, how might this be beneficial? So we've got a, a, you know, a client who struggles very much to get into the trauma memory. We know from research that VR uh, can be acceptable. Um, you know, this is someone who maybe engages because of uh, use in, in sort of in games and stuff, and is quite happy to try this out. Caught him attention as attention uh, novel. We put this headset on, and we've allowed him to um, expose himself more to the trauma memory and, and recount that narrative. Okay, and I'm not going to go into the therapeutic detail of what this session, what this kind of reliving session might, might involve but the idea is that we are facilitating or helping him to open up the trauma memory so that that natural kind of clinical kind of processes and procedures and protocol can be can be assisted and, and skip again go, going back to that point this isn't about changing well evidenced protocols this is about enhancing what's already there and what's shown to be effective um for the um for the for the client okay so that's one use. And 360 video, I think, is useful in its own right in terms of how do you, um, in terms of a, 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 an accessible technology, um, doesn't cost that much to use, fairly easy to apply that we can perhaps bring in to assist um, in the treatment of uh, PTSD. However, is there a way, and what we are kind of our proof of concept peaks, if you like, is really much around can we get the best of both worlds? Okay. Can we get the interactivity with VR with the low cost and easy to apply nature of 360 video? So what we did was we went back to the same alley and using an iPhone, just took a couple of pictures, okay. And uh, linking in with our partners in ProPeer, what they were able to do was take this 2D imagery and sculpt it within a 3D uh, environment, okay. And this is uh, what was produced. So on the left is the 360 video one, and on the, the right is the 2D imagery sculpted uh, in the 3D environment. Now, the big thing that to notice about this is that the one on the right was created in just over a day, okay? But what we see is that we have now is we have the ability to move and interact within this environment, okay? So we've taken um, some real imagery, we've put it into a 360 environment, uh, and we've now enhanced it because we can interact more within it. Okay, so, so by doing that, we've unlocked a lot of the features uh, within VR, we believe anyway. And if you see here, I'll just pause that. I mean, the image on the top left is shot in, I think, a pretty decent 360 camera. It's about 5.7K. And uh, this image here on the right is uh, from an iPhone. Uh, but I think it's kind of, uh, you know, it's very realistic and it's not too far away. Uh, in terms of uh, quality, if you like. So we, we think that there's there's kind of a nice balance here and great potential uh, regarding to use that. And because, as I said, we can use, um, we've now unlocked some of the kind of features of, of VR, if you like, or more features are more custom than VR. Uh, we've got all these customizable options, so we can change the time of day. Uh, we can introduce a virtual body, which I think is very interesting. Again, let the person feel that they're in the space um, and what we can also do is bring the therapist into the um, the environment as well so the person with the trauma can uh, can walk the therapist through and we can walk around and get different perspectives for Peter what we didn't have with the 360 video was that the reason he fell was trying to get uh, out of the road of a car okay and because we've now changed the environment or built the environment this way we can add stuff in okay so um, we can put cars in uh, smoke, fire, blood, different things that might help someone to recreate that uh, that that environment, uh, if you like. Okay. So one of the things I thought was interesting, just from my own work that might be quite good here, is also testing out some theories uh, in relation to uh, you know these peri uh, traumatic appraisals that people are, that, that have. So I worked with someone who um, witnessed a car accident. 
uh, a fatal car accident. And uh, one of the big things that this person struggled to shift was that they seen the car was driving in an erratic manner. And uh, and they knew at that point, well, or they said that they knew at that point, something was going to happen, someone was going to get killed. And then they watched this poor person getting um, getting hit by the car and then was over um, at the body when it was there, or just, uh, just immediately after it happened, okay? And one of the things that we um, did within a normal course of therapy was trying to work out the... Was it reasonable because this person felt very bad that they didn't shout to warn the person to get out of the road in time? Wasn't it reasonable that that person could have warned the individual and that person could have reacted in time to get out of the road, given where the car was and how fast it was driving? Okay, and we had to work out then how fast the car was driving, how many seconds uh, it would take them to drive that or how uh, how much distance they would cover. And through the course of that and uh, trying to put piece things together, we worked out that the person had to um, essentially, they had about a second and a half to um, shout out and warn this person uh, to get out of the road. And then what we also figured out was that the actual uh, place where the person was hit wasn't where the body was, okay? So the body was on, on further down and they'd forgotten about that. OK, so they thought there was actually more space between than there was. So I think there might be opportunities using this technology as well to kind of recreate and customize at the lat level. OK, for, for specific things. OK, so show me exactly where the trauma occurred. Where were you standing? Who else was there? And um, could you react it in this way? That ability to kind of, you know, put in scenarios to see different different kind of perspectives on it. And then to wrap it up then regarding the potential implications. So there's a significant reduction in cost and time to, uh, to produce these environments, okay? So the process of sculpting around images is extremely fast and can be typically completed within one day. So this is proof of concept work, okay? So that's our disclaimer. We haven't tested it out. But what we have done is um, by, I suppose, um, going through this process is showing that we can produce these environments very quickly, okay, using real uh, imagery, okay? But combining that with the ability to move and interact with the, with, with the environment, OK, footage can be taken by therapists or practitioners. Uh, this is all iPhone footage in that in that uh, that second environment that I've shown. Uh, and it can capture location specific to a local area, so more recognizable. So go back to that point about the bespoke nature, the idiosyncratic uh, sort of appraisals uh, of the event. And that gives us the ability to do that. OK, because we can reduce it quite quickly and keep the cost down, it's less of an issue of spending a lot of money for to recreate an environment that only one person may benefit of. Uh, we can introduce virtual objects to the scene to recreate traumatic scenes. So one of the disadvantages we think of uh, 360 video could be that it's it's happened after the, the traumas happened. So if it was a road traffic accident, by the time you get out, it could be weeks or months. You know, the car isn't there anymore. The road's been cleared up. Life's went back to normal. Uh, so we could recreate using the 360 imagery and virtual objects. We could recreate that um, that traumatic scene uh, to help, um, you know, the, the therapeutic process. And then the therapist and the practitioner can join the client in the virtual environment. So for this, uh, we're hypothesizing that that might, you know, give us some more, um, you know, clinical information and detail that might help the, the, the therapist work out um, you know, maybe some of the hot spots in the trauma memory or uh, a, a more effective strategy and where they might want to take the treatment. And then it's not just about exposure. There could be other kind of or like a, the reliving and imaginal exposure. There could be other um, applications for this around uh, stimulus response discrimination and then also in preparation for site visits, uh, which tend to come a bit later on in the uh, therapeutic process. So um, that's me. I have no idea what time I ended up doing, folks, but um, hopefully uh, I wasn't too. Thank you, Paul. Tom, no, that was brilliant. Uh, just coming up to five. So for me personally, I'm happy to continue if others are. If Tom, Paul, uh, Albert, if you're, if you're all happy to stay on. Um, if people have questions, um, I, I would take another 10, 15 minutes. Um, if you want to do that, I know I have a dozen. I know that Jerry has probably a dozen as well. She's over in Northern Ireland, so it's particularly relevant. Um, so I'm going to, if, if that's OK with um, at least the three presenters, if anyone needs to go, we understand um, we are recording this, so you can always um, get the answers later on. And if you need to leave, please 
it's it's been good to have you. So I'll, I'll just quickly hand over now to Jerry if you want to ask your question. Thanks, Clive, and um, thank you all. Yes, so I'm Jerry. I'm the Chief Executive and Victim Support Northern Ireland, and um, so here in Belfast as well. Just I want to thank all three speakers. I find that really interesting, and the whole virtual reality thing really does blow my mind a bit. So I'm I'm very excited um, about what I'm hearing this morning or this afternoon. But I suppose I have, I have some questions. So I'm not sure if it's Paul or Skip or Tom, who's the best person to answer. So it's more, I'm not sure I'm going to form this into a question very um, eloquently. And it's maybe more a statement as well. But there's two things spring to mind, particularly, Paul, when I see the use of the, the 360 and the interactivity. We have dipped our toe a little bit in the water in 360 um, technology a couple of years ago. We actually, ha it's more in the justice field rather than health, though. So all of the courtrooms in Northern Ireland, we have 360 videos of. So you can go onto our website and visit the site uh, or visit the court that you're going to see in advance of giving evidence at trial. Um, but it's not virtual, you know, it, it is kind of 2D. You're just doing it on the screen and we don't have the lovely headsets. Um, but I am now looking at that five pound box thinking that looks quite exciting for us. But I suppose getting to my point is I have some fear in the potential therapeutic use of the virtual reality as you've described kind of in the Peter scenario, if that therapeutic intervention took place before the court case. And in Northern Ireland, um, some of you will know it takes approximately two years for a lot of cases to get to court. So you would like to think therapy had happened before that, but we have quite a, quite a few issues around disclosure. And one of my worries would be is if there was this intervention with a victim could the defence counsel potentially use that to discredit their initial statement um, and I don't think that's a reason not to do it I just think it's something to be conscious of um, as we continue to develop this thinking so that's my kind of note of caution um, but then I also have a wow how exciting could this be potentially in the future in the justice arena around witness testimony and I'm, so if we think now how people give evidence and what they tell the police is there is normally it's it's verbal, it's written down and there's a written statement and then they're cross examined on that in the court environment. Is there potential for VR to be created based on the actual experiences and recollections of victims and witnesses and the accused? So could everybody give their statement and actually we could see for a jury, they would be seeing in virtual reality, different people's perceptions of what happened and in terms of bringing something to life. So I'm not really sure it's a question. It's just the two places that my head went to when um, I was I was kind of starting to think a little bit um, of what you've just presented. So I'm not, not really sure how, how any of you may want to respond to that, but um, there it is out there. That's straight off the top of my head. But yeah, I'm, I'm very, I think it's very exciting. And thank you again. Paul, I think you're on mute. I think one thing definitely that skips talk as Shona says that you can do anything uh, really I think anything's possible um, in terms of the, the legality of it I, I understand where you're coming from but um, I don't uh, get too involved in the legal processes behind these things but I do know that um, it is the one condition where um, it's not, not the only but it, it tends to be the one where if you're going to ask for a for a report, if you know someone you're working with is going to ask you for a report, it, t it tends to be um, PTSD as where well, uh, when when you get asked. Um, so I know there is some kind of tension there, and uh, probably uh, just more than my brain can handle in terms of uh, how much I I've looked into it. Um, so for me, uh, my line has always been uh, someone in front of you. I will be treating whatever's in front of me, and whatever legal processes are going on aren't really my concern. Um, so. Yeah, that's that part. Uh, so I, I don't have the answer uh, for for that part. If someone else has a has a, a has a legal brain around these things, can maybe uh, elaborate. In terms of your your question about the courts, um, there is actually a bit of work we're doing at the moment. Uh, Lorna Montgomery in Queens. Um, that's an it's a it's an adult safeguarding 
uh, project. We're linking in with Wales Aberystwyth University and a professor called Sarah Wydell, uh, who would be um, a pretty well known um, academic. And there is discussions around a project there in the new year, and it involves, the reason I bring it up in terms of safeguarding, it's focused on um, elder abuse. And um, part of that is about trying to help those individuals manage the court, the evidence given process. And uh, discussions are happening there around the use of immersive 360 video and techniques to support that process, but also to support the training and interviewing of people um, before they go in the before they go into court as well. So there are discussions around this application within the court based context. So that might be a useful uh, link for you to, to follow up with, with Lorna. And I think that sorry, Skip. Oh, I was just going to add that um, about two years ago, we were approached by a legal team in Washington, D.C. that was the head of a class action suit against uh, the country of Iran. Uh, for producing a special type of improvised explosive device that was used in Iraq um, for, you know, uh, in, in, you know, combating, uh, you know, U.S. soldiers and so on. And it led to a, a lot of, you know, a lot of injury. And so they were suing Iran because they weren't, uh, they weren't actually, you know, they were viewed as a terrorist group. I don't want to get into all the politics. And they wanted us to take Brave Mind and to create um, an easy to use experience in a three in a, a spherical uh, context that would give jury members the experience of being in a vehicle while being blown up uh, with the with the the nature of these types of uh, devices, and it ended up that the judge. Um, decided not to allow it in court uh, because of uh, a variety of reasons that they gave uh, for this. But the, but the prosecutors, the legal team, really felt that, that talking in abstract or showing regular videos wouldn't have the same emotional impact, and they wanted to get that emotional impact. Um, so what you're talking about, Geraldine, is not uh, far-fetched, and it will become um, an issue, and it'll be a lot of ethical issues. You know, if you put somebody in a simulated environment that's not an exact replica, if you if you're not using 360 uh, video, are you going to induce a false memory? Um, you know, I mean, whether you will or not, uh, this this is the stuff that legal people will go head to head with. Um, but certainly, we're talking about VR as an emotionally evocative experience. Uh, the capacity to deliver emotionally evocative experience, whether you use 360 video, which I think is great, um, or using 3D graphics. And there's a ton of issues that are going to come up in the near future, particularly as the technology becomes more accessible to everybody with consumer devices. So really good point you bring up. Um, I, I think one of the things on, around all of this that that is also interesting is how we can streamline processes. And I, I think I was talking to uh, Paul the other day about the technologies you see that the UK police uh, are using with their being able to video and gather evidence digitally. And I think if they have in mind different processes, that same film, if they use it on a 360 camera, could then be used for victim support purposes afterwards as well to enable um, enable therapists to work with victims to to review what's happened. And I know we have we've had lots of conversations with um, the federal prosecutors here in Belgium who um, w uh, showed the CCTV footage after the Brussels attacks to to victims, hundreds uh, of victims, and just being able to recreate what's happened and suddenly realized there was one um, victim in the um, uh, the metro attack on the on the on the underground that uh, they they believed that they were right next to the bomber and everyone said that's not possible because they were survived and everyone around the bomber died and it was only because of the CCTV footage that they could see what actually happened and that they were right next to the bomber and 
there was one person between them and the Roma that saved that person's life. These are the sorts of things which when, when you kind of see what's happened and, and, and the patient can re be, have that situation, you can have benefits. Uh, sorry if you can hear the dogs barking in the background as well. Um, my question is, um, I love all of this and I see so many opportunities. I mean, you saw, you talked about training clinicians. I think about training victim support workers. My question is actually, how do you go about, what, what does it take to turn any of this into something practical? So uh, I'm working with Victim Support Northern Ireland or, or an organization in Belgium and we want to work with any kind of victim group. What does it take to turn one of these technologies into something useful? How much time and effort does it take to create an AI or an avatar that's able to respond? Is this like huge amounts of many years of research with dialogues? And so I'm just curious about the process by which you create a, a real world scenario that can be used. And also, um, you mentioned about clinicians that the majority of pe people who support victims outside of the therapists are not clinicians as such. They're highly trained and professional, but they're not psychologists, for example. And I'm wondering how these technologies are, could be used in, in those environments as well. Whoever would like to answer. I was, I, was the first, I was the first one to speak, was it? Yeah, I think Skip's the best place to focus on developmental processes of these type of technologies, I think. But as, as Paul pointed out, 360 video is very low level stuff. But um, obviously, the, the more time you invest in existing in, in a solution, the better it will probably be. Although I think that like conversational AI stuff, uh, the, that threshold is increasingly getting lower and lower as you can build on what has already been developed, I guess, and that you can use also s applications that do not necessarily have, were designed with clinical applications in mind. Uh, I mean, you have regular conversational AI now for customer services and they tend to improve in that domain as well. And so the, the leap that you need to take to move towards clinical applications tends to decrease uh, and, and at the moment I think at a, an increasingly rapid speed uh, but that's that's just my point of view so I, I think uh, Skip perhaps can add to that as well. You're on mute. Yeah but you're muted Skip at the time so um, yeah. Uh, um, on, on you know breaking it down into two areas one building places versus building people that you can interact with virtual people um i think building places i think the the 360 video and the photogrammetry approaches are, are remarkable and relatively um, easier to produce um you know it's it depends on on the the type of trauma with combat related ptsd you know, we started off with one world in the early prototype, then we got some funding, we built out four worlds. But, you know, when that was applied clinically, I was getting phone calls from clinicians all the time saying, do you have an Afghan village? Do you have a forward operating base in a mountainous area? We didn't have that. We didn't have the funding to build out that content. Finally, over a couple of years, we got more funding and we we were informed by patient feedback and clinician feedback as to the diverse nature of the combat world in Iraq and Afghanistan that we needed to create to make it more relevant to the widest range of users. Not to make it an exact replica of what they went through, but at least have generic worlds that we can put people in and modify. So that was a those were year long projects. But when you look at, um, like you mentioned, uh, the bombings, uh, you know, and the and, and some of the, the specific incidents that Paul presented, that can be done very quickly in, in a day or two. And and I think you can start to build out a library of these scenarios that allow them to be expanded. So. I agree that exponentially it's getting much easier to build out things, but it really depends on what your clinical target is and what the nature of uh, the trauma 
battlefield, if you will. But, you know, we're working with police now and building out, you know, what are the core elements that you need to have for a standard police de-escalation scenario? Well, it could be in a crowd, it could be in a mall, it could be in a bar, it could be on a quiet street, a roadside. There's many worlds that you need to create. Eventually, we will have generic libraries of these content that clinicians will be able to draw from. And with a 5G connection, hopefully the clinician will sit back with a tablet and be able to pull from a cloud-based library of thousands of pieces of content what is relevant for each clinician. So that's a sort of a future in that. Um, on the AI and the virtual human front, uh, there are, is a lot of third-party software um, and you can do a lot of basic things really well, but once you start to get into more evolved things, this is why even though I think that building virtual therapists is, you know, is something we have to pay a lot of attention to and be very careful about, I don't think that's going to happen right away. Uh, with the level of natural language processing and the logic model need to form it and and all that. So that fight will occur in the next five years sometime, um, the ethical battle on that front. Uh, but for simple things, simple chatbots and things that evolve over time, uh, you can do meaningful stuff in a year, maybe two years, um, but it's not like flipping a switch. I mean, because these are very complex uh, types of systems. Yeah, but I, I think this idea that we could be coming together and and continuously producing new scenarios and and having a library of them available to organisations, I think this this could could be a uh, an amazing opportunity. I'm curious about one thing. What what do you think might be the uses for pre-trauma resiliency training? Because what one of the things that that oh, in two ways, one of the things I'm interested in is seeing how we can help populations, children and others actually build resilience so that if a crime or an attack of any kind, a trauma of any kind happens, they're, they're more ready to cope with that situation. And the other one is, is thinking about um, preventing the onset of PTSD. So if I think about uh, maybe the Bataclan or Perks or Paris attack, any attack really, you have a whole range of people and so one, a proportion of those will uh, suffer PTSD and in a severe attack it's quite a high proportion. And I'm wondering whether you can use, um, you can use uh, VR to um, preempt the onset of that or, or reduce the risk of it in any way. And do you have any knowledge, uh, information on that? Um. I, I, I'll just speak real briefly and just encourage you to send me an email and I can send you back uh, links to a set of six immersive narratives that we created for pre pre deployment resilience training, where instead of sitting on a couch and watching Band of Brothers, you know, on a TV, you're in the Band of Brothers episode with characters going on missions where bad things happen at the end. But so up to that point, it's an inoculation or an, an emotional obstacle course. But at that point where the bad thing happens, in walks a virtual human mentor that guides you through the coping strategies that might be useful in that specific context, whether it's acute uh, stress reduction with a breathing exercise, with visualizations of lungs expanding and contracting as you're doing a, a simple 514 or 415 um, activity, breathing activity, or with higher level, uh, you know, cogn fighting off cognitive distortions and, and discussions about what areas of the brain. So that all that, there's videos of these immersive narratives um, of one person's view, mind you, that are on YouTube, that if you send me a link, I mean, send me an email, I'll, I'll bounce you back a, a little white paper that summarizes that work, describes the scenarios, and talks a little bit about the research. And I can send you a lot more. We get a lot of writing on it. But our, but you bring up an important point. Our job was to take the content we developed for treatment scenario and try to put ourselves out of a job on the back end treating PTSD by doing a better job emotionally preparing service members for the types of stresses, you know, and a 19 year old who goes into the military and 
up to that point, the biggest trauma they experienced was Mary Sue breaking up with them before the junior prom or something, and now they're going to war. How do you prepare somebody for that horrific and unnatural and wrong experience? Um, and so that that was the mission. But I'll, I can send you content where you can I'm actually see any emails. This. Don't worry. Are there any other questions? I have many, but I think uh, we're already twenty minutes over, and I don't want to take people's time too long. Are there any final questions that anyone has? The, the only thing I would just say, sorry, Lance, just to jump in on that, in terms of how do you make people more resilient, and then how do you stop them from developing PTSD? I mean, one of the things that um, I always remember in terms of the post uh, trauma stick with is the fact that you won't get a diagnosis of PTSD within the first month. Uh, it's acute, acute stress disorder. And and I think that's very important because, you know, it's about normalizing that as a process, you know, in, your body will react in a way that's entirely natural and normal until you figure it out. And it's about not kind of pathologizing that. Um, being very careful and there were some interesting studies a few years ago Skip will probably know around um, clinical incident debriefing and uh, and how that actually um, you know uh, some people if you think naturally about 60 percent of people will will come back for it without any treatment but um, they ended up people getting an intervention designed to reduce PTSD actually maintained or created the condition if you like um, and that's because people started giving it talking about it and giving it more meaning uh, than it than it needed to. And one thing that um, if you go my background is cognitive therapist, so I always look at the kind of the cognitive triad in terms of people's beliefs about themselves and the world and other people. I mean, that fundamentally shifts after a traumatic event. All of a sudden, because of the way you reacted, you have certain negative feelings and beliefs about yourself, but also other people can't be trusted. The world's a dangerous place. You know, I'm not invincible anymore. It's just like fundamental shift from this. So there's one traumatic event that's been generalized to everything. So there's a time in your life when you didn't feel safe. You maybe thought you were going to die. And now all of a sudden you've used that to generalize to, to, to the whole world. So, I mean, how do you prepare people um, for that? I think the key bit of work is that you can't. I mean, it's impossible to predict, you know, who's going to have a traumatic experience and who isn't. But I think there's that period afterwards. And I think schools um, have a big role to play there in how they respond after um, traumatic events. Yes, we need support systems to come in, but we also have to make sure that um, you know, they're not pathologizing uh, what's going on. It's natural to have nightmares. Do you know what I mean? If we all, had, you know, had, fine if you have a nightmare, you know, you're a bit skittish, you're hypervigilant for a while, you're anxious, you can find it hard to settle. It's about just reassuring that's okay, it'll pass doesn't mean you're you're ill as such so that's a big thing that stands out for me in terms of um how you manage a kind of the post trauma the immediate yeah i i think for me part of it i i understand about the the kind of debriefing issues um part of it for me is around giving people life skills it's not about pathologization it's 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 about um giving people life skills about fulfillment and well-being and, and knowing, you know, simple things about gratitude, journaling, uh, meditation, whatever it may be, though, those things which we are starting to understand now are so important for our day to day life. Um, but the vast majority of people aren't aware of those things or even if they are, they're not making use of it. Uh, and I, I, I'm wondering about how we can use these different technologies as a as a lever for um, victims or individuals to sort of maintain stability. I think that that's part of it. I, I, I see it. I think, uh, Skip, you said this in your previous presentation. These are technologies which are tools for people to use. Um, it's not a it's not the solution. It's not the sole, sole solution. It's how we combine those different technologies together to, to get a result at the end of the day. So I think that's kind of where uh, there are so many opportunities besides the many others that have been mentioned. Um, I think we had better bring this up. Ah, Jerry, you wanted to say something else. No, I can. I'll just go and keep talking. So I'm not. I'm <laughs> stopping. Sorry. I, I, I think we will have many more opportunities to talk. I very much hope that 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 we'll all stay in touch. Um, for those uh, for those of you who are interested, we will um, provide the recordings 
of the um, of today and of the of the conference. We'll make those available on our website and on YouTube. Um, I think uh, I believe all of the uh, information for registered participants will be um, emailed. So if you want to make contacts, then they can do you can do that as well. Uh, this for us is just to start. It's the start of a conversation. Um, part of the solution is finding the funding, and that's that's what we're also trying to do. So I really appreciate the time, uh, the effort to get up so early, and uh, I have the same problem. Um, but thank you so much for, for all the effort you've put in. Thank you for everyone participating, and I look forward to the next steps. Thank you very much. Have a great day, everyone. I'll see you soon. Yes, thanks very much. Thank you. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone.